one of the last words that Jesus spoke on this night was, Arise, let us be on our way. Did you ever hear that? Those verses before? Jeanette, do you know who wrote a book about that, Jeanette? Yeah, Arise, let us be on our way. Pope John Paul II wrote a book after that little verse. It's when Jesus was in the garden, and it's really the last words that he said to his disciples when they were just those together. They were sleeping, he woke them up and he said, arise, let us be on our way. On your way to what? That, right? He knew where he was going. Those were his last words. Arise, let us be on our way. He did three things this night, my friends. And he did these three things to help him say those words. The first thing he did was clean the disciples' feet. And they objected, didn't they? Why are you doing this? It's not necessary, right? They came together for the Passover supper. And so they're saying to the disciples, why are you doing this? It's not part of the supper. You're interrupting the service to do this. Why? And I'm sure they had the same comments when Jesus at the end of that supper actually celebrated the first mass. Why are you interrupting this? There's no need. There's no need. And then he took them to the olive, of, the garden of olives, right? And what did they do? Fell asleep, right? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? The first part, he wanted to teach his disciples. But the mass and the prayer, he wanted to do to teach them, that's what you knew, need to do to be able to experience that. And for us to live a good Christian holy life, my friends, we need to follow suit, don't we? We need to follow suit. He spent that time in prayer and he celebrated Mass. But they looked at it as, as an interruption, didn't they? As irrelevant. You know, I read an interesting article this past week. The author was unknown, but he was talking about interruptions in life. One was late for work because their son was going to kindergarten. Another was late because they were going to bring in donuts for the workers. They had to interrupt their schedule. Another one was because her alarm didn't go off. One was late because there was an accident on the turnpike, that interruption. One was talking to a family member about a crisis. As she was walking out the door and had to go back, talk to her family member for quite some time, another interruption that caused them to be late for work. Another child was sick and was not able to go to school and she had to make arrangements. Another interruption. Another one got new shoes the day before and as he was walking he realized he's gonna have a blister. So he actually went into a drugstore and got a Band-Aid. But all those people are alive today. All those people that they were rudely interrupted are alive today because they were late for work on September 11th. They were late for work on September 11th. And they're alive. 
interesting, isn't it? You know, my friends, when we pause in life and when we interrupt things, like on Sunday morning, we interrupt the time that we want to spend just hanging out and come to church. When we interrupt our morning, our busy mornings with a little bit of prayer, see, it interrupts. But when we interrupt it, we'll be able to say these words that Jesus said, Arise, let us be on our way. There was a woman, Millie. She had four, four children. The youngest one was Mark. She started a, something to do that during Lent, and then she continued to do. She was trying to go to Mass every day, so she would drop her kids off to church, or drop her, her children off to school, and then go to Mass. And it worked out well. And then she continued that, that practice for years afterwards, because she said, you know, it was a great way to start the day even though many people look at it in other ways. And she said it was also a great time for her to pray for her four children that were getting older. She was baking cookies on the last day of the school and she's thinking to herself, you know, my schedule is gonna be all disrupted now because all the kids are gonna be home and you know, it's gonna throw my morning schedule off and things like that. And she's baking cookies for the last day to, for her children. And she's realizing that her youngest son, Mark, is late. Five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And she's thinking to herself, Mark is never, ever late. turns off the oven, goes down to the bus stop, which is a little bit of a walk, and the bus actually let them off at a busy street. They lived right off of a busy street, but the bus left them off on the busy street. And she gets up to the bus station, where it was a little bit farther down, and there's uh, two paramedics, police cars, all flashing lights. And she's thinking to herself, oh my word. I hope it's not Mark. She walks up to the scene, and as she's walking there, all sorts of things are going through her mind. And the night before, this little boy says to her mother, ironically, right before this happened, Mom, do you believe in guardian angels? And she was half paying attention. She said, yeah, of course I do. And she said, why? He said, I bet my angel's really big. Don't you think so, Mom? And she said to him, why are you saying that, Mark? Because I'm the kind of kid who really needs a big angel, Mom. That's why. He runs off. So she gets to the scene. This whole scenario is running through her head. And then they finally get to talk. She gets to talk to the policeman, and she says to him, is my son okay? And they said, yes. They're not sure how, he, how serious he's injured. He's breathing. There's no sign of bleeding. And they said, that's a good sign, but there could be all sorts of internal injuries. They said, what happened? And she said, yeah, apparently the, the other boys that were there that weren't paying attention to what they were doing, he ran across the street and he was hit by a car going 45 miles an hour. He darted right out in front of the car. The paramedics said they didn't, didn't want to touch or move him because he could have some serious spinal cord injuries, either neck or their back, and they were very cautious to move him. So they got him to the hospital, and of course she followed them there. An hour later, he was released. No bruises, no scratches, no bleeding. Everybody was shocked. On the way home, 
this little boy says to his mom, you know, mom, I saw my angel. And he, she, he said to her, you should see how big he is. He said, I told you, mom, I need a big angel. She said, I don't, he said, I don't remember. I just remember seeing him. He picked me up. He gently put me down. And then he was gone. Millie said after Mass, she would always pray for her four children. And now she prays who all her children are grown and she has ch grandchildren now. She continues to pray for Mark that that big angel will continue to protect them. But you know, my friends, many people think it's a waste or an interruption to go to Mass or to pray. But Millie is convinced of its power and we would never tell her otherwise. There's a story of a Persian king who was elevated from poverty to the royal throne. And when he became a king, he sent his servants to the old shack where he lived. And he said to them, gather some of my old clothes, my broken toys, he said, a crude wooden bowl. He said, and some other mementos that are laying there, he said, please bring them. And they brought them all to the palace. And he had a special room that he would put all these items in the room. And every day at the same time, he would spend an hour sitting in this room. One day he was interrupted, and one of his servants asked him why he does that. And he didn't answer him. He simply pointed to a little framed picture that he had there with three words on it, lest I forget. Lest I forget. Tonight, my friends, may our prayer be that we will always, always remember the importance of what we do here and the prayer that we spend in the morning that will be ingrained in our minds and in our hearts and our habits, lest we forget. We pray that we will always be there, lest we forget. God bless you.